You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. Today is the 1st of February, 2016, and today we're going to talk about something that I wrote about recently on the website, uh, namely Morris Strong. And you will be forgiven if you, all of uh, your, your knowledge of Morris Strong comes from the recent coverage of the memorials that were uh, taking place for him in Ottawa, you may be forgiven for thinking that he was simply an environmental leader in a straightforward sense and simply concerned with the planet or something along those lines. And certainly we have seen a lot of people paying tribute to him as a visionary who was interested in changing the world for the better. Uh, but there is a much, much more interesting, much more detailed, much more nuanced story that paints an altogether, I think, different picture of the modern environmental movement and more specifically the international institutions and organizations that have been created to forward that movement. And on that note, uh, again, people who read my recent article will be familiar with Elaine Dewar, a journalist, a Canadian journalist, who wrote a, a book a couple of decades ago called Cloak of Green, which I mentioned in that article in which I would highly recommend as an interesting source on, on, on the environmental movement and its development, and also Morris Strong, who she had the opportunity to interview for that book. Uh, she is at elainedewer.blogspot.com, and you can check out some of her other books, including Smarts, The Boundary-Busting Story of Intelligence, and The Second Tree of Clones, Chimeras, and Quests for Immortality. But today we're going to be asking her to stretch her memory back a couple of decades to talk about Cloak of Green. Elaine Dewar, thanks for joining us today on the program. Well, thanks for asking me. Well, as I say, you did write this book a couple of decades ago, and I understand that this was an extension of uh, your your own experience in the late 1980s, being concerned, as most of the planet was at that time, with some of the, the, the types of stories that we're hearing about the destruction of rainforest and the depletion of the ozone layer, and that led you on a personal journey that took you in places that perhaps you weren't expecting to go. I would love to hear about how Cloak of Green came together and what really propelled you towards writing it. Well, it, it got started in the strangest way, actually. I was looking for an escape. Um, I'll just tell you this quickly in background, but prior to this story, I'd been working on a very large and complex story about a developer family, which ended up in a huge lawsuit, um, and it was consuming, and I really needed a story that would take me away from my daily concerns. And the story that presented itself was about the dangers um, of the um, expansion of Brazilian society and the building of a large series of dams on the Xingu River system in the Amazon and what that might mean to the global climate, to the atmosphere, to all of us. The, the theory then was that the major CO2 sink in the world was in fact the forest and that the forest was being destroyed by development and the only people who stood in the path of that development uh, were a group of uh, native people from Brazil called the Kaiapo. So I attended a major fundraiser that took place at a church in downtown Toronto, and I believe it was 1989, uh, perhaps 88, uh, in which Piacon, one of the uh, leaders of that group, um, was presented to the crowd as a representative of groups who would take money, put it to good use, defend the rainforest, and protect us all from um, a, a massive and dangerous uh, impact on the global environment. I should point out to you that I found it very strange um, that in Canada, where we have had a very complex and unkind relationship to Native people, that so many people would have turned out um, to support a Native person from another country. I mean, it was great to see, and it was also very odd. Um, and what was also odd was, as it transpired, the Native group in um, question was, in fact, trying to use changes going on in the uh, Brazilian political structure to afford a kind of sovereignty to themselves, to delineate their uh, territory, to prevent people from coming in and out, and in effect to take a kind of sovereign control that had been taken away from them by uh, an encroaching Brazilian state. So that was where the story started. 
And I followed it down, and I was surprised to find uh, a number of Canadian environmental organizations that I've had reason to rely upon in the past as a reporter, who were suddenly turning their attention away from Canadian environmental issues to the Amazon rainforest. And they were all, you know, trekking down there, going to conferences, raising money. Um, in any case, slowly and carefully, um, layer by layer, I, I was dragged down to an understanding that these groups that I thought I knew and thought I understood and thought were democratic and related to the community turned out to be groups that, um, in effect, took direction and took certainly large whacks of money from the corporate interests that they were decrying in public and from governments which were organizing uh, towards what's called the Rio Summit. And that introduced me to Morris Strong. I, in fact, had met Mr. Strong years before at a dinner that was given by a colleague of mine and had always been sort of interested in in what he'd done with the formation of Canada's national oil company, which is called Petro-Canada. I had reason to um, do a piece about Petro-Canada after Mr. Strong left the organization and it was run by someone else. Um, so I had sort of bits and pieces of information about him, and I knew lots of people in common who knew him. Uh, so connected but not connected. And the Kayapo story took me to the preparatory conference uh, for the Rio Summit, which Mr. Strong was organizing for the UN. Now... I, I think that's extremely important background, and it does help to, uh, I think, elaborate the point that this book is about the bigger picture of these environmental organizations and their connections. But I think Morris Strong is the perfect microcosmic example of that from his own biography. And to give people a sense of Morris Strong and the organizations that he was involved in, I mean, it's it's so almost laughable that uh, the, the when you actually try to line them all up and, and just enunciate them. And I, I pulled this from his official website, talking just about the post-Rio Summit years of his career, where he continued to take a leading role in implementing the results of Rio through establishment of the Earth Council, the Earth Charter Movement, his chairmanship of the World Resources Institute, membership on the board of the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the Stockholm Environment Institute, the African American Institute, the Institute of Ecology and in Indonesia, the Beijer Institute of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and others. Also, Strong was a life, la, longtime foundation director of the World Economic Forum, a senior advisor to the president of the World Bank, a member of the International Advisory of Toyota Motor Corporation, the Advisory Council for the Center for International Development of Harvard University, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Conservative U Conservation Union, the World Wildlife Fund, Resources for the Future, and the Eisenhower Fellowships. And that's just a slice of a couple yeah, of decades it's, of his biography. It's, it's, it's missing a lot of stuff, like the Ethiopian famine, etc. Um, no, this is a very, very, very interesting human being. Um, I don't know if your listeners care to know about how he grew up, but, you know, he was born in Oak Lake, Manitoba, very small community, not far from Brandon, which is not far from Winnipeg. His parents uh, really suffered during the Depression. His mother apparently died in a mental institution. Um, there was a lot of hunger. Life was really bloody tough. He ran away from home. Um, I think he was in grade 9 or grade 10, got himself on lake boats, got himself under the Coast Guard. This is all during World War II. And eventually, you know, finished grade 11 and went up to Chesterfield Inlet, which if your listeners are familiar with Canadian geography, is on uh, the coast of Hudson's Bay, um, way up north, and went to work for a Hudson Bay Company factor. Um, at a very, very interesting time when the government of Canada was trying to figure out if it could actually defend our northern borders by moving troops um, up to the north, up to the mouth of the Coppermine River, uh, and then down to Edmonton. And when they were also searching for uh, uranium, uh, as you may recall, uranium became a strategic material because of the Manhattan Project, um, and everybody from 45 on was trying to find uranium, and uranium was in fact found at Baker Lake. So Mr. Strong 
sort of enters the big world through a guy by the name of Wild Bill Richardson, who was a sort of prospector, um, married into an oil family called McCall, uh, whose company was called McCall Frontenac. It was a, a major importer of oil from the Middle East. Had been taken over long since by the Texaco company through a brokerage house called Nesbitt Thompson. So, in a way, Mr. Strong was introduced to the world of big oil um, and the world of resources at a very young age, was picked up as a very smart kid, taken under the wing of a man named Paul Martin Sr., who was a cabinet minister um, and whose son would go on to become the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, and introduced to the oil patch through people at the very top, and that would include David Rockefeller. So his his life story is a story of layers, of understanding how networks work, and being introduced at the very top rung of the, uh, I guess you would say, the industrial uh, and resource um, developers who were advancing the American empire at the end of World War II. That's where he gets his start. And he very quickly became a very significant figure in the Liberal Party, the dominant political party in this country for many years, um, became very active in the oil patch uh, in Calgary, uh, was allowed to run an oil company by the time he was 31, um, backed effectively by, uh, I guess you would say, Rockefeller, uh, owned or Rockefeller controlled independent oil companies and um, became a very active player in the Y network. The YMCA in the immediate post-war period was a very interesting organization, both nationally and internationally. It had um, outlets in places on the other side of the uh, Cold War boundaries. So it had uh, outlets in China, it had outlets in, in Russia. And um, a great deal of the political discourse that went on post-war happened in unofficial and informal places like the Y. So, so Mr. Strong was extremely well placed in all three, politics, business, and what we call civil society at the same time, and advanced himself through those networks very quickly. Now, I think an important aspect of this story is the uh, the types of organizations that Strong himself really spearheaded or set up or was the founding director of that appear on first glance to be governmental or at least quasi-governmental organizations, but when you scratch the surface are, are much different entities underneath. And I think one example of that from relatively early in his career would be after he was appointed uh, to Canada's external aid program and developed the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, and the International Development Research Centre, IDRC, which probably not a lot of Canadians have heard about but continue to function to this day. Of course, set up as and and uh, ostensibly uh, programs extending can Canadian aid to uh, to developing nations, but as you note in your book, really a, an interesting way of peddling political influence in the developing world. Um, that of course, yeah, was... and for Canada, that was particularly important because you know we, it, we had going on in Quebec in the early '60s something called the um, Quiet Revolution in which uh, the strictures of a very uh, conservative Catholic Church were being overthrown by a population that was for the first time getting access to uh, higher education in big numbers. Um, and Mr. Strong, at that point, was uh, working as the vice president and then the president of Power Corporation, Another one of those layered organizations that had huge political uh, influence as well as huge business influence. Power Corporation ended up having a huge pile of cash deposited in, in its lap when its hydro operations, and I believe Manitoba, British Columbia, and Quebec, were um, taken over by those provinces. And suddenly with cash to spend... Um, sort of turned itself away from being a power operation into being a different form of power operation with a great deal of political influence. So Mr. Strong um, left Power Corporation uh, 
when his uh, colleague and partner, Mr. Paul Martin Sr., was head of external affairs, the minister of external affairs, took on external aid, which had, at, at, in those days, a very small budget and almost no staff, turned it into the Canadian International Development Agency again with almost no money and almost no staff. And so he made a deal with SNC, which is now known as SNC-Lavalin, a a, a huge engineering firm, to hire people that he approved of, not hire people that he didn't approve of, and take on contracts in Francophone Africa. The concern at the time was that uh, a French Gaullist government would stir the pot in Quebec and that it would stir that pot by one of its colonies in Africa suddenly recognizing Quebec as a sovereign state. That was the fear. So the question for the government of Canada was how do, how do we forestall that? And the answer turned out to be go and do a bunch of aid deals, make them nice and sloppy, uh, allow people to uh, be as corrupt as nature uh, allows them to be, uh, and meanwhile, do some good in the world, but keep your keep your ear to the ground in French Africa and keep control of events. So Morris Strong basically led that effort. I, uh, such a remarkable political coup, and yet it only represents, again, just a tiny fraction of what Strong was involved in, but I think gives a sense of, of the way that he used the various organizations uh, that, I mean, certainly he, he leveraged a lot of the power that he was given or appointed. He uh, saw business as the answer to how he would get power. He didn't have an advanced degree. He'd wanted to be in external affairs. They wouldn't take him. They wouldn't even let him apply because he didn't have a university education. So he decided, okay, business is my entry point. And um, he used it pretty brilliantly. Very smart man. Indeed. Well, let's talk about another extremely important organization that he helped to found after uh, first chairing the first major global environmental conference, the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm, which led to the development of the United Nations Environment Program, which was situated in Nairobi, Kenya. And as you write in Cloak of Green, uh, uh, Nairobi was Strong's old stomping ground, having, I believe, uh, lived there in the 1950s briefly. Uh, placing yep. UNEP in Africa was explained working as... Working for Caltex, by the way. Yes, he was uh, working for an oil company, company of course. stomping all over, stomping all over um, the, the uh, East Africa. Yes. And then you go on to say that placing UNEP in Africa was explained as a sop to the developing countries who had been suspicious of Western intentions, but it was also useful for the big powers to have another international organization in Nairobi. After the Yom Kippur War in 1973, Nairobi became the key spy capital of Africa, which, again, I think led to another intriguing layer to the possibilities of someone like Strong and his involvement in organizations like the Y. Right. Right. I mean, he, 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 his, his major um, gift is information, using it, finding it, sharing it, and leveraging it. And uh, yes, using narratives uh, to help paint pictures that will uh, help place him in positions of other power. Well, uh, then let's let's project this forward. We could talk about the Burnt Land Commission and other things that he was involved in. But uh, as you say, this leads towards the 1992 Earth Summit, the Rio Conference, which is, I would assume, for anyone who was at least alive at that time, will probably remember that uh, that conference and all of the, the media coverage that surrounded it. And it's still today cited as one of the major uh, touchstones of the environmental movement. Um, and of course, it was chaired by Morris Strong. Let's talk about your relation to that conference. And as you say, the preparatory uh, work for that conference, where you actually got to to meet with Strong and interview him for the book. Right. And he, he was very helpful. I mean, he, <laughs> naive Canadian reporter who, who really doesn't understand the way the world works goes to see Mr. Strong. That would be me. And he opened every single door there was to open. Um, he asked every question that he, every question I put to him, he answered. Um, had I not been prepared, I'm sure the answers would have been different. But, you know, what I was looking at was how is it that all these environmental groups, which are supposedly located in locales, that would be Canada and in, in, in the case of the groups that I was following most closely, but also have all these international connections. How is it that all of these groups are getting funded by governments and by really large uh, 
oil and gas interests and shipping interests and whatever. How, how did that work? And, and what are they doing at this conference in the case of the Canadian organizations actually appearing on the Canadian delegation on the one hand, and on the other hand, when they're meeting in a private room or, or a room they hope to remain private, which I sort of busted my way into, um, how come this, these NGOs are being organized by people who are in fact being paid by the government of Canada to organize them? I mean, it, it became uh, a kind of exercise for me to see who was connected to who and how they all ended up back in Morris Strong's lap. And they all did. They all had either funding or uh, governmental help or were reporting back to the government um, when they were presenting themselves to the world as non-governmental organizations, which is to say representatives of the grassroots. There was nothing grassy or rooty about any of them. Which I think lends itself to the question, the fundamental question of what this is about, because Morris Strong obviously had his own interests to, to, to peddle and he had his own power and influence and money and, and things of that nature. But this is clearly about something more than one man or his vision. And sure, this is about shaping political opinion and about shaping political opinion in places where, you know, one man cannot make a difference. So if you're trying to shape the political opinion of the United States of America, there better be lots and lots and lots of people out there carrying that message, the message that you're trying to uh, shape in the public eye. It, it, one guy standing on, on a soapbox is going to make no difference. Thousands of organizations uh, with their own advertising campaigns and their own local um, impact are going to make a difference. And he understood that from... I would say the early part of the middle 60s when, uh, for example, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who became prime minister in 1968, uh, didn't just get visited upon the Canadian public from nowhere, but in fact had been groomed for a public role by Power Corporation years before. So he understood the power of the right phrase being carried out of the right mouth and appearing on the right television show at the right time. In the uh, conference in Rio, his major ally for that conference, for getting his message out, was Ted Turner, who covered the thing on CNN, right, left, and center, and whose people at uh, CNN were working with the Kaipo in Brazil and trying to raise funds and trying to bring attention to the Amazon issue long, long, long before the conference actually took place. So he started organizing for that conference in, I believe, 1986, 1987, when the Swedes asked him to take it on, and, and uh, the conference took place five years later. So that's five years of relentless organizing, relentless fundraising, large corporate interests to NGOs, NGOs funding other NGOs. Um, it, it was an incredibly complex bit of business, which he orchestrated brilliantly. Well, let's talk about what they were ultimately hoping to, to leave as the impression for the general public. If this was an, uh, a, an operation to try to influence public opinion, what was that geared towards? And let me just point out well, to this passage from, from your book that I thought was particularly important in that regard. You wrote, Rio was publicly described as a global negotiation to reconcile the need for environmental protection with the need for economic growth. The cognoscenti understood that there were other deeper goals. These involved the shift of national regulatory powers to vast regional authorities, the opening of all remaining closed national economies to multinational interests, the strengthening of de decision-making structures far above and far below the grasp of newly minted national democracies, and above all, the integration of the Soviet and Chinese empires into the global market system. There was no name for this very grand agenda that I had heard anyone use, so later I named it myself the Global Governance Agenda. Can you tell us about that agenda? Well, I think if you think about what was going on at the time, you'll sort of have it. I mean, Brazil was chosen or self-chose, it chose itself as the site for this conference um, as it was coming out of its the last throes of a military dictatorship. It was becoming a new democracy, and it was trying to control um, the shape of that democracy. And many parties who had interests in Brazil, Canada being one, uh, were attempting in their own way to shape 
how that democracy would function. So the Canadian embassy was very active with the Brazilian government on the one hand and with Brazilian NGOs on the other, uh, funding NGOs with the right views um, and those NGOs, because of the rules in Brazil, were putting money into the political process. In other words, giving money to political candidates and helping them get elected. I mean, that kind of thing was legal in Brazil. It's illegal in Canada. It's illegal in the United States, but, you know, different rules for different folks. So at the same time, uh, things were very strange in China. It was going down the... um, opening of its economy road while also repressing uh, a democratic movement in in Tiananmen Square in 1989. So they wanted to have political control with an expansion of a more and more capitalist-based economy. Um, Russia was going through a a collapse. I mean, in effect, Gorbachev's... um, democratic and and perestroika, its reorganization of the way the Soviet state conducted itself, had basically come unstuck. And it was transiting very, very quickly from a totally authoritarian state to something entirely different. Everything was up for grabs, and and it's a huge oil state. So people with interest in oil and gas were very concerned about the political structures that would ensue in in the Soviet Union or the post-Soviet Union at that time. The World Economic Forum, which Morris helped to found, was a place where all of these groups came together to have discussions out of the public eye. So if you were a Chinese official and you were trying to open up your economy, but you were afraid of going too far and losing political control, there were lots of people at the World Economic Forum at Davos who would sit and talk with you about how you might manage these transitions. And there were lots of corporate interests who were happy to tell you that they were happy to help and, you know, who knows, maybe your kid could be uh, educated at Harvard and you could have a nice house in Vancouver five years down the road. So all of these places, these sites that Morris organized were organizing towards a larger open global economic system where local uh, political authority would have less control and larger, uh, possibly non-democratic authorities would have more control over the shape of things to come. The European Union was coming into existence. I mean, when you think about the amount of political change that was going on from, say, 1986 to 1996, it was absolutely bloody staggering. And he was sitting in the catbird seat for a lot of that change. And in a way, you were uh, you were riding shotgun for that ride, uh, perhaps sneaking in the side door. Um, and, and as you alluded to, perhaps they weren't necessarily expecting someone like yourself in the midst writing about this. What was your sense with Maurice Strong? Was he was he guarding and defensive with his questions and answers, or was he quite open nope. about this? Very open. Uh, one of the things that interested me was the question of whether he'd set up an intelligence system for this country that functioned abroad that was informal. And he, <laughs> I put that question to him, and he basically said to me, well, I didn't really think about it that way, but you know, now that you mention it, well, yes, I guess. He also described his situation at the UN. He loved working at the UN because he said he had more unfettered political power at the UN than any Canadian cabinet minister, even a prime minister, would have. He was able to fund his own office. He was able to fund his own officials. He could do it without being audited. He could move money here, there, and everywhere without anybody asking him any questions. I mean, he he had unfettered power. And he also described the UN system as an open, leaky ship in which everybody was watching everybody else. So he assumed that, uh, you know, the KGB or the, the... follow-on organization, the FSB, was watching him. He assumed that MI5 and MI6 and CIA and everybody was watching everybody else, and they often uh, gave him information or shared information with him uh, that might be of use. And yes, he was open about that. He did not, he, he, he did not back off one bit when I asked those questions. That is uh, that is fascinating. And perhaps, I mean, I, again, it, it doesn't seem like he was very secretive about this. It just, he was, uh, no one no one paid attention to what he was doing in the general public for the most part. 
despite the, the extraordinary number of uh, connections that he had in the business and in civil society world. Uh, did I you think mean- quite a few people paid attention to him here. I mean, you know, you can't do this kind of, of um, how should we call it, weaving of interests without running into trouble. And he ran into several problems, in the, especially in the later course of his career when things began to pile up. I mean, people noticed that he had uh, acquired the ownership of a ranch in Colorado sitting on top of a huge aquifer and that there was a business plan that he was a part of to sell the water from that aquifer while he was running the Rio Summit. And people said, what the hell? You know, what's going on here? How can an environmentalist be selling off the aquifer that all these people rely on? What's going on? There there were many moments in Mr. Strong's career when... um, he was close to the line and people thought he went over the line and there was a hue and cry. Plenty of them. And yet he, he had nine lives until the oil for food scandal. Uh, And that, well, even there, what happened to him? Well, nothing, nothing legally. He was a happy boy. He ran away to China. Uh, Did you maintain any kind of, he ran away to the largest economy in the world. uh, And he seems to have had significant influence over the shape of things in China. Fascinating, um, especially given the historical influence of the Rockefeller family in China as well, and maybe just continuation of his and earlier. the Demereff family in yes, China. indeed. The Canadian Rockefellers. Um, again, just so, so, so many different aspects to this. I, I guess the final question, did you maintain any sort of contact with Strong over the years, or did you follow his career after that point? I followed his career um, as best I could from a distance. I obviously went on to other stories. Canada, I don't know where you're from, James. Are you from here? I am from Calgary. From Calgary. So you understand that this is a smallish place, and especially if you're in the media, um, you're going to know lots of people who know lots of people. So you'll you'll be in a kind of milieu where uh, there are lots of connections. So, for example, um, Mr. Strong's protege, John Ralston Saul, is a very active um politically active writer in this country, and I would run into him on other issues for years after after this book was published. Uh, one of his um, one of his friends uh, and associates was Adrian Clarkson, the Governor General. Um, I would run into her. So it's like what, what it's not as if um, I looked for Mr. Strong after this, but uh, there were lots of sort of crossovers that continued on. His influence is difficult to miss, I guess, if you're moving in high circles in Canada. Well, it's not that the high circles, it's media circles. You know, if, mm. if you do this kind of work, you're going to cross paths over and over again with people who are, are uh, making decisions because it's a small number of people making decisions in this country. So Stephen Lewis lives a few blocks from me. Stephen Lewis and Morris Strong are, were working together on uh, the the conference in Rio and work together on African issues. And, you know, it, it, you're, you're going to keep crossing paths. Well, then I, I guess my final question may, may be a bit unfair since you haven't looked at this issue for a couple of decades now, but I, I guess I'd just be interested in your take of whether you, you believe that these organizations that you're covering in Cloak of Green, do you think they've fundamentally changed since the time you were covering them or are they operating in, under the same principles? No, they're operating under the same principles. They're not democratic organizations. This is the thing that I found most staggering. You know, I operated under the assumption that since people came to my door and asked me for money, uh, that they were voluntary or based organizations with, you know, huge numbers of people supporting them. In fact, when I went back after um, that PrepCom and started to actually look at these organizations, just look at what they published about themselves, interviewed the people who ran them, it became staggeringly obvious that they were not membership organizations and that memberships controlled their behavior and controlled their um, their agendas. They were very small organizations that raised large sums of money and used those sums of money to have political influence. That's what they were about. And I'm talking about World Wildlife Fund. I'm talking about the uh, about Pollution Probe, another spinoff from po- po- pollution probe called energy probe i mean small organizations with a large political reach fascinating issue and probably one that there's still a lot of meat left on that bone to pick at um hopefully 
you or someone can be recruited to do that at some point in the future. But I guess we'll leave that. The question you haven't asked, though, is whether they were correct in their arguments about the environment. I mean, to me, the, the really important thing, the thing that drove me to this story in the first place was degenerating air conditioning. Um, you know, we're, we're breathing stuff that's crap. Uh, is global warming real or is it not? I mean, there are a number of questions that were very alive in, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And the question is whether they were right. Were they right that the global environment is degrading, that the that the climate is changing and changing radically, and that human beings are uh, have a large role in those changes? And to me, the answer is yes. Human beings do have a large role in those changes, and we need to do something about it. The question is what and how. Well, exactly. If every single organization of any political influence is controlled in some way, then what is the the ultimate aim of this, and how do you go about changing the the way that it's structured? Well, nothing stops us from starting our own organizations that nobody controls but us. A tall order. I think you've just put a (laughs) tall order on the plate for the listeners out there who are concerned about these issues. All right. Um, I, I think we will leave it there. But as I say, uh, uh, Cloak of Green, we've talked about that book quite a lot throughout this conversation. I'll, obviously, a I'll link to your website, but I am dismayed to note that the only actual copies of that book that I can find online are used copies since it's out of print. And the cheapest one that I could possibly find was seventy plus dollars, and the most expensive one was twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think the thing to do is to go to the uh, format site, Formac, the, the publisher's name is Lorimer, and ask for a copy, and I'm sure they'll send it to you. Any chance that there will be an ebook re-release of this book at some point? This book was done long before, uh, you know, digitization became ubiquitous, and I, the only thing I can think of is that for a while there, you know, when uh, Google was basically grabbing all books and libraries and, and making them available online without permission, uh, it was available then. You could click right through and read the whole thing online. Since then, it's been taken down. But I'm sure that a book can be purchased from uh, Formac, which is the name of the company that does the printing for Lorimer out of Halifax. All right. Well, once again, we'll direct people to elainedewer.blogspot.com. And I understand you're writing a new novel that you're putting online for free. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, the novel uh, I wrote a few years ago, and there's a, another one that follows on after that. So I've been having fun. Interesting stuff. Well, Elaine Dewar, I do tr- genuinely thank you for taking the time to talk about this uh, today. It's an My important pleasure. subject, and, and uh, your book was very important on br- great, breaking a lot of that ground. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Introducing The Last Word DVD. For the first time on DVD, you can own all seven episodes from the first season of The Last Word video series, including The Last Word on Terrorism. You see, to Kissinger and the other adherents of the globalist ideology, terrorism is simply a word for any act that threatens the agenda of the globalists. The Last Word on CCTV. But there is something more fundamentally troubling about this entire CCTV surveillance grid than mere hucksterism. The last word on utopia. The most pernicious evil always presents itself as something necessary, something transitory, a mere waypoint on the road to the land of milk and honey. In this way, the masses can be led to not only tolerate the most intolerable conditions, but actually to support those who would seek to rule over them. And the last word on independence. It is a choice that we make each and every day to live in independence or in slavery. Every day is Independence Day. The Last Word DVD. Buy your copy today at CorbettReport.com.